Please join me in welcoming Rhoda Woolley. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I am living the dream. Life is good. And I'm really excited to get to spend a little bit of time with you today talking about something that I feel very passionate about. Are you starting to have thoughts on occasion like, am I supposed to have things figured out more than I do right now? Like, <laughs> like really, it feels like people around me are starting to like settle into this is you name it, this is the major I want, this is the job I want, this is the city I want to live in, this is, uh, I'm in a relationship that I want to be in. And you see people around you that may be starting to kind of settle into that, and you're kind of like, man, I'm not, I'm okay, but I'm not like doing like that. I'm not feeling like that. I'm looking forward to talking with you today. Even if you do kind of feel like you're in that place where you're getting things figured out, it changes as you go throughout life. So when we, just working with college kids, about half of the kids that go into college know what they want to do. They kind of, when they come in, they kind of are able to declare their major. And about half of them change while they're in college. So change is normal. We discover who we are, who has God made me to be, what gifts has he given me, how do I use those gifts? That's all absolutely natural. And we're supposed to be wondering, how do I do that and how do I do that really well? In fact, I get concerned about people who never ask themselves that question. Okay, so there are people who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s who have never really thought about it much or paid much attention. They just kind of routinely go through the motions. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today, all right? We'll just jump right in. Who am I? What is my purpose? I want to convince you or encourage you to, to realize that you were designed on purpose for a purpose. And we're going to look at what that looks like during our time together. So if you're feeling some of that pressure... Oh, these different types of things. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? Major job, church, friends, best friend, these things that other people seem to have figured out. We're going to be talking a little bit about that as we go through our time together. First off, the psychologist in me, uh, I have my PhD in educational psychology, the study of the brain, how learning happens. The psychologist in me wants you to help you understand introverts and extroverts. You guys have heard of those terms, right? What do you usually think of? Introverts are people who need time alone, right? That's how they recharge, by being alone. And extroverts are people who need to be around people and to recharge. And then you have people, I'm an ambivert. I'm like, it's a, it's a scale, and people that are kind of in the middle, you need some time alone, but you also need some time around people. I think an awful lot of us are that way. There's a new theory out that also posits that introverts are people who think so they can speak, and extroverts are people who speak so they can think. Does that resonate with you at all? Some of us need to talk about it to really get it. So I want to honor both because it's how God made you. He didn't make a mistake. You are an introvert or an extrovert by design. God likes both. He appreciates both. He made both. He likes variety. So every once in a while, I'm going to give you an opportunity to reflect. And you can either turn and talk to somebody next to you. Or if you're an introvert, just sit there and kind of think and maybe jot down some notes. So, if you go to turn to talk to somebody and they're like this, turn the other way. Okay, we're going to honor both ways that God made us today, all right? So, right now, I would like you to just turn and talk to a neighbor about what are some things right now where you're feeling settled or unsettled, or you can just think about it, ponder it, just reflect on your life where you're at right now. How are you feeling? Where are you feeling settled? And where are you kind of unsettled? Chat amongst yourselves or yourself. Thank you. 
wrapping up those conversations. So there's a method to my madness in that the theory also said that people who are extroverts, who speak so they can think, they're not fully engaged until they can start talking about it. So now hopefully we've got everybody in the room thinking about this topic. So thank you for doing that for me. Uh, Jesus says in John 10.10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, right? Uh, The word joy is used over 300 times in scripture. And it's not always waiting until we get to heaven. Jesus would like it that we have joy in this life right now. And he is, you know, what's the fruit of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, patient, right? patience. He is our source of joy. We can have joy regardless of our circumstances, but he wants us to have it. And so how do we go about having joy in our lives regardless of what our circumstances are? If you would have met Jesus back in the day, walking down the road, if you would have met him, as you would have passed, you guys would have told each other, shalom. Jesus would have wished you shalom. We oftentimes think that that means peace, but it's so much richer than that. The real meaning behind shalom incorporates harmony, peace, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, tranquility, like no war, no hunger, no strife, that you have a full and complete life of wellness. That's what you're wishing people. Jesus would have wished that upon you when he met you, and Jesus would have wished it upon you again when he said goodbye to you. Isn't that a cool thought? That Jesus would want, like us to have shalom in this life now. Now, he also tells us that in this life you will have troubles. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So Jesus promises us we're going to have troubles. This life won't always be easy. But he wishes for us to have shalom. What's going on there? Let's dig into it a little bit more. I've spent a lot of my time studying the topic of thriving. Some people call it wellness. Some people call it happiness. I'm not crazy about calling it happiness because I will get really happy seeing a puppy. But that's not the exact same thing as wellness, right? Wellness is a a standing, foundational, you're going to be okay regardless of your circumstances. So the Apostle Paul wrote several of his epistles where he talks about joy while he was in a prison. Right? We can have joy regardless of our circumstances. So when we look at the topic of thriving, uh, in psychology we've studied people who weren't doing well for most of the history of psychology, but for about the past 40 years we've been doing, studying people who are doing really well. And if wellness is a scale of 0 to 10, What can we learn from the eights, the nines, the tens? What are the common characteristics among those people? And here's what the research will say. Different studies will call them different words, but this is kind of what it boils down to. The number one common attribute that we see amongst people who are thriving, regardless of their circumstances, is a sense of gratitude. Number two is close but a little bit different, contentment. Number three is a sense of purpose. Number four is healthy relationships. Number five is health, and it's, the secular literature will say it's spiritual health, physical health, and emotional health. And then uh, uh, learning, the opportunity to learn new things. It's a common characteristic among people who are thriving. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> and then also a, a sense of hope. And this hope is almost like goal setting, like having a plan, knowing that it will be thwarted, and having backup plans, that resiliency to keep going, plan B, plan C, plan D. Those are the common characteristics of we, that we see amongst people who are thriving. Now, I don't have time to talk to you about all of these today, but there's one I really want to zoom in on, and that's purpose, which is so closely linked to identity. So who am I? What's my purpose? One day, you're going to take your last breath. Just think about that right now. There's going to come a time in your life, nobody's getting out of here alive. There's going to come a time in your life when you breathe in, And you breathe out, and that's it. You're done. Who will you be then? If we're talking about identity, if we're talking about purpose, who will you be when you take your very last breath? Or, more closely, what part of your identity will live on after you take your last breath? Will it matter if you were married or single? Will it matter if you had a job or if you were homeless? Will it matter if you had children or grandchildren or you didn't? Will it matter if you were a drug addict or if you weren't a drug addict? Will any of that matter when you take your final last breath? What will be the only part of your identity that lives on? Anybody want to share? Your faith. faith, Right? Who you are in Jesus. I am a redeemed child purchased by the blood of Jesus. That's what carries on after I take my last breath. That and that alone. 
So Ephesians 2 is one of my favorite parts of scripture. Oh, I'm going to handle myself. Um, First off, let's just talk about our identity for a little bit and who God made us to be. Scripture says, King David says in Psalm 139, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Do we have anybody here that likes to knit? Knitters in the group? A couple of you, kind of? I tried it once. (laughs) You have to be a perfectionist to knit, right? If you're knitting and you make a mistake and you're like, it's not that big of a deal, I'm going to just keep going, what happens? That's all you can see is your mistake when you're done with it. You just have to rip it out and redo it. Now, some pastors have told me that the original word they wouldn't have knitted in King David's time, it would have been wove, wove together in your mother's womb. But same thing, very, very intentional, right? God is a perfectionist. He didn't make a mistake when he made you. You are exactly the way he wants you to be. You are the right height. You are the right complexion. You are the right body type, right? God likes variety. We have St. Bernard's and Dachshunds. And no matter how much a dachshund wants to be the size of a St. Bernard, it's not who God made them. And no matter how much a St. Bernard wants to be the size of a dachshund, it's not who God made them, right? He made us different. He likes variety. Uh, You have the right abilities, the right attributes, the right interests for his purposes. Because in Ephesians 2.10, let me back up. The first part of Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 9, is talking about how we're saved by grace through faith. It's a free gift. Nothing you or I have to do for it. Jesus just says, I love you. Here you go. You are mine. That's our identity. That's the thing that we have when we take our last breath. It's what Jesus has done for us. That's our identity. But then you get to verse 10, and it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared in advance for us to do. In the original, the word for that workmanship, some translations say handiwork, in the original, the word used for that is poema. Does poema sound like an English word to you? It's where we get our word poem from. Kind of a cool thought. You're God's poetry. The person sitting next to you is God's poetry. Each poem. Have you ever written a poem? Did you have to do that back in high school English? Every poem is uniquely crafted and designed, and we use different things like alliteration and onomatopoeia and different literary devices to try to make it to be concise with words and and to say just the right thing with just the right intention. We're very careful about crafting a poem. No two poems are just alike. That would be redundant. Every poem uniquely created for a purpose. You're God's poetry. The person sitting next to you is God's poetry, uniquely created for a purpose by his design because he's got a plan for you. God is relationship, right? You don't get any more relationship than Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in one. He is relationship. He's all about relationship. He works in relationship. And he wants to partner with you to serve the world. He wants to work through you. It's kind of just how God works, right? He uses us as conduits. So we have a super generous God. He's given us enough of everything, right? He gives us his love. And we're supposed to enjoy and relish and cherish that love, but then we're supposed to share it with others. He gives us peace. We're supposed to accept that peace and share it with others. He gives us patience, and we're supposed to share patience with others. He gives us financial resources, time, money. We're supposed to take it, use it, enjoy it, and share it with others. Like, God, that's his economy. He uses us to be a conduit for what he wants to put out into the world. So we're his workmanship. Our identity is that we're his, redeemed, he's done it all, that's our identity, and now he's given us gifts and abilities that he wants to use to partner with us to touch the world. That's who you are, that's your identity, that's your purpose. So we have to step back and say, what has he given me? What's on my heart? What gifts do I have? How do I use those to serve the people around us? And I would hope, encourage you, to do this pressure-free Like, Jesus has done the really, really hard part already. When he was hanging on the cross, that last thing that he cried out, to telestai, stands for it is finished, right? He did the really, really hard work. He's taken care of the hardest stuff. He took care of our biggest problem, solved that, and he's gifted us. And now he says, have fun, have joy. Use the gifts I've given you to serve the people around you. And we don't have to feel pressure or overwhelmed or wonder. We can just say, here I am, Lord. I love you. You love me. Use me. What's the adventure today? What do you want to do? Who do you want me to touch? Who do you want me to impact? I'm here. Here I am. Send me. 
right where I am. That's your purpose. That's your identity. So what does that look like? How do we do that? When you think of what God, God's plan for us, he doesn't ask a lot of us. He asks us to love God above, love him with our heart, soul, and all of our strength, right? Heart, soul, mind, all of our strength. And he asks us to love others as we love ourselves, right? That's pretty much, Jesus said, if you sum up all the commandments, that pretty much covers it. Love God, love others. So we love others by using our gifts to serve them. And in doing this, that's one way that we worship God. So how do I go through my life loving God, staying connected to him, loving the people around me, serving them with the gifts he's given me? One of the fancy words that we talk, to use when we talk about this is vocation. Not vacation, but vocation. And uh, vocation is kind of that invitation or a calling to connect with somebody. And so vocation or your invitation, God is calling you For the things you do, the things you enjoy doing, the people that you interact with, as you use your gifts for God's glory and gratitude to him, interacting with all these people, that's your vocation. Part of of it's your job, part of it's your schooling, part of it's family, part of it's friends, part of it's if you're in a relationship with somebody, uh, someday vocation, or for some of you it may be being a husband or wife, being a grandparent, probably right now being a son, a daughter, a sister, a brother, a cousin, all those are part of our vocation. Being a citizen of the United States, if you interact with people there, being a citizen of your town, uh, being a member of a congregation, all those are places you interact. So as we intentionally think, how can I serve those people faithfully? That's my vocation. That's what God is calling me to do. So take a moment now, and again, you can either jot down, list, make a list of some things, or talk to somebody next to you. What's your vocation right now? Where, what are the th- where are the places that your life intersects with other people and God could use you to serve them? Just ponder that for a moment. Chat if you'd like to. Martin Luther used the word masks when he talked about this. He said that we are the masks of God. You and I are the way that God interacts with the world. So God likes an orderly society. He talks about that in scripture. So back in the day you had, um, well, just just think sanitation. If you want to live in a clean city where there's not trash all over the place, right? Bubonic plague started with a dirty, dirty, filthy trash that wasn't picked up in a city, right? So one of the ways that God establishes order is through your trash collector, the person who comes around and picks up your garbage. That is a way that God is serving the world. Because that person does their job faithfully, shows up at work, faithfully using their gifts to serve people around them, and God works through that. That's part of vocation. That's the masks of God. God uses the police officer, the fire, fire person, the doctor, the nurse, the attorney, the teacher, the mechanic. Right? Just think, uh, if you're going to buy a car, all of the people, you're going to be blessed by having a car. right? Think of all the people that had to show up and faithfully do their work for you to have a car. Not only was it the person who is putting a bolt in in the door, but the person who's painting it, the person who built the assembly line, the person who programmed the machines, the person who cleaned the snow off the street so that the worker could get to work in the morning, the person who is working in the cafeteria so that the worker has food to eat. All of those people have to show up in life faithfully and do their work for me to be served by having a car, right? So as Christians, how do we do that with a happy heart, using our gifts to serve others? We're the mask of God. But sometimes when you're thinking about, but I don't know what mine is, what do I want to do? Just one question that I'd like you to really consider, and I think this is an important question for all of us to consider, what breaks your heart? If there was one problem in the world that you could spend your lifetime trying to make that better, what would it be? What's that one thing that you're just like, ah? So imagine for someone it might be, you know, do you have friends that say, how can there possibly be a loving God when there's starving children in the world? Like, how could there be a loving God if there are children that don't have food to eat? Well, we know there's a loving God. And we know that there are children who don't have food to eat. So how do we resolve that? If that breaks my heart, could it possibly be that that's the problem God wants me to work on? There's enough food in the world, but we have problems with logistics and getting it around to people. We have problems with commercialism and greed and that sort of thing. So what if I spend my life trying to figure out how to get food to starving children? And that's how God wants to use me. All right, so sometimes when you can think through what's the thing that breaks your heart, 
It's going to be different for each of us because God put that in our heart. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do things that he's prepared in advance for us to do. He has a plan to work through you to make a difference in the world. So he wants to work through us, and you may not make your living from this, but as you do it, you'll find absolute, complete fulfillment. So it's just something to be pondering as we go through this. We also want to take a look at our strengths. We were talking about strengths in a couple of sections since I've been here. And each of us is given different strengths. We know that God likes variety, right? We look at nature around us and see variety. How many kinds of trees are there? How many kinds of flowers are there? God could have said, you get one kind of flower, you get roses. And you get one color flower, yellow roses, that's it. Right? That's not how God works, right? There's how many kinds of flowers? How many colors of flowers? How many kinds of dogs? How many kinds of grass? You know God likes variety when he makes different kinds of grass, right? So if he likes variety in his nature, he's built variety into us as human beings. Because together we serve as the body of Christ. Individually, none of us have it all. But as a, as a team together, we get to be the body of Christ, do the work Jesus did while he was here on this earth. And it takes all of us working together, all of our different gifts. So he likes variety. How am I gifted? What are my strengths? It's different from the people around me, usually. It's different from the people in my family, usually. So how do I figure out what my strengths are? And then how do I respect and appreciate the strengths in other people so that we can unite and use our gifts together with a common goal? I love the word community. If you, I'm kind of a word geek. I'm an old high school English teacher. If you break down community, what's the core of it? Common unity. Right? We have this common thing that we're united on. You and I have such a tremendous purpose in the Great Commission. You know, How does the world know if we don't tell them? And Jesus has called all of us to be a part of that royal priesthood, to go share the good news that we have. Jesus has taken care of our biggest problem, to tell us that it's finished. He's taken care of that. And now we just get to celebrate him and what he's done and use our gifts loving people and have fun doing it. Right? That's a common unity that we can work together towards. And so in order to do that, I have to know my gifts, and I also have to appreciate the gifts in the people around me. So there are some different tools. Um, I've been hearing conversations revolving around some of these different tools, and I'm happy to share more with them. They're, one of them I did, forgot to put on here, and I know Mike's a big fan of it too, is the Enneagram. It's free. You can take that. It's a nice, nice way to help you understand part of your personality characteristics within that. Um, Clifton Strengths, probably a lot of you have taken. I've spent a lot of time with that one. I think that costs $20 to $30. Um, so if you don't have the money for that, another one that's really, really good, the Standout Report, Marcus Buckingham is one of the guys that helped develop Clifton Strengths, and he has since developed another report. It's free, and it gives you t your top two strengths that you have, and it really helps like in the working world. Like, How do I show up at work? What do I have to contribute to a team that way? There's some really good spiritual gift inventories out there. Uh, I was speaking at a women's retreat in the Shenandoah Mountains one time, and I invited my sister to come along. And I took my first spiritual gift inventory. And my top two that come up are teaching and administration. And my sister's top two that come up are things like, or her, her top ones are like working in the kitchen, making banners. She's very crafty, uh, communion, fl uh, altar, flowers, communion. I don't even know what the things are called. <laughs> So she was very, very good at that kind of stuff. And that would be like torture for me to have to do that. And it would be torture for her to like teach a class or serve on some sort of administrative committee. God has made us different. And all of a sudden I was like relieved. Like I don't have to feel guilty when they ask me to like bake a cake and I don't want to do it. <laughs> That's not where my gifts come in. How do I use my gifts to serve the Lord? Because somebody else can bake a cake way better than I can and they're going to enjoy it more. And so when you know what your gifts are, it also helps you figure out how you can serve and serve with a happy heart instead of serving with resentment and saying, I'd rather not do this. Evangelism. Some people love to go knock on doors and hand out tracts and talk to, pe talk to people. Other people are like, please don't make me do that, right? That's okay. John the Baptist and John the beloved disciple had very, very different personalities. And I'm sure they had very, very different ministries. God used them in different ways based upon how he had created and designed them. So work to find a way that you can contribute in a way that's authentic and meaningful and you can enjoy that contribution as you serve your church and serve your people there. Uh, there's also a fun tool. I can make it available to Mike so he can make it available to you guys. 
Um, it, you, it's, a, it's like a NCAA bracket, you know, for the tournaments. It's like that kind of bracket, but you come down to two words that are your personal mission service, m missional pur purpose. So it, it just helps you boil it down to like two words. So all of us have the Great Commission, right? All of us, it's to, to share the good news. So mine is celebrate Jesus and ignite purpose. Those are the two things that just turn me on is when people can go through life feeling like they're on purpose. Hence why I like this talk so much, okay? Questions, thoughts, insights so far? Anything you'd like to share for the good of the group or ask? All right, we can give you more details on these tools if you would like. Just let me know. So um, how could you imagine using one of your gifts to serve in hum uh, humanity? What's, what's one gift that you feel like, man, this is, this is a strength or this is a gift I have that I could use to serve? Let's just take 30 seconds right now and just kind of ponder that and try to write down a word or two so that you can go back and think, spend more time on it later on. What are one or two gifts you have that you could possibly use to serve the people around you right now? talked earlier about working with other people in common unity, community, and appreciating the strengths of others. Sometimes this is easier said than done, right? Have you ever worked with somebody and you're just like, man, if they would just do this different, they would be so much easier to work with, right? Have we, I think we probably all thought that at some point in time, right? I think sometimes God sends those kind of people into our life to make us better. I like to think of those kind of people as heavenly sandpaper, you know, if you were to take sand, what does, what does sandpaper do? It, like, refines. It wears, on, wears down, rough, smooths out rough edges, right? I think sometimes God sends people into our life who aren't just like us, who do things differently than us, in order to help refine us. One of my dearest friends in the world started out as a colleague. We worked together at the college. And he one time introduced me to somebody as nauseatingly positive. And I had to step back and say, ooh, okay, I don't want to be nauseatingly positive. I've got to, it's, positivity is in my top five, but I have to make sure that I'm stewarding that well because for some people, they're just not in the mood. <laughs> and so I have to be aware of that and use my gift in service to other people, not just because I, you know, like, lighten up, buttercup, it's okay. <laughs> I have to be careful about that. Not everybody wants that every minute of every day. That was heavenly sandpaper. God used that person to help me think of others instead of just like how I want to show up and feel, but instead to really take a look at the situation and, and what's appropriate at this point in time. I have other strengths besides just positivity. Maybe sometimes I need to use a different strength. Okay, so that can be heavenly sandpaper for us, making us better. The other thing I want to talk to you about for just a moment, uh, Mike and I had talked about this when we were first meeting, was just part of our purpose. We live in a society that oftentimes thinks that we're not complete until we find somebody else. Like, if you are single, you must not be happy. I don't know if you guys ever get that or not. You ever get that feeling? Like, oh, how miserable they must be, that poor person, right? I just want to encourage you. Uh, as a 55-year-old woman who's never been married, no children, I've raised nieces and nephews and had lots of students and lots of family and but just have not been married and I'm not opposed to being married it's just not something that God has given me in my life I'm not saying he won't ever but the, the I think the key is I am 100% whole and complete just as I am and when God sends somebody into my life that together we can serve him better than I can alone then I'm open to being married but I don't want to be married for the sake of being married because I know a lot of people that are miserable who are married for the sake of being married, right? And so here's my, my takeaway, and we're going to talk about this more. I think we're going to get together on later on in the year, possibly, and dive a little bit deeper into this. How do we be content regardless of our circumstances, right? I think that being married is one of the most beautiful things that could ever, ever happen. Like, that is the picture that God gives us when he wants to say, like, what's perfect love look like? The love that Jesus has for us. He uses the, the bride analogy and that, that marriage thing. What a beautiful, beautiful gift. But it's also very, very hard. So it's a tremendous blessing, but it's very difficult. Being single, 
Paul will talk about it being a tremendous gift. If you're single, you can devote time and energy to the ministry, to serving other people. You know, I've been able to accomplish a lot in my career, in my, in my life, in my ministry, but I don't have to be home every night at 5.30 making dinner and tucking kids into bed. I just, he's given me a different life. So I think the thing is to be content regardless of our circumstances. Being single can be a beautiful blessing, but it can be really hard. Being married can be a beautiful blessing, but it can be really hard. So whatever your circumstance is, how do you be content? And know that our completeness comes from God, not from another person. He did say it's not good for man to be alone. We've got companionship, right? We need people in our lives. But he hasn't necessarily given marriage to everybody. And that's okay. How do you be an example of being content and happy and joy-filled regardless of your circumstances? Even when your friends are saying, are you really happy? How can you possibly be happy? And you can say, my happiness doesn't come. I mean, you know, my joy is on Jesus. He's the, he's, he's the rock that I build everything on. So we're going to talk later on more throughout the year about, about that and that mindset, that heart set, and how we converse with other people about that. And I think that hopefully would be more of a, a discussion. But I um, just want to encourage us, how we think about things matters. So what is this thing behind the boat, right? That's a little boat, and then there's waves behind it. What's that called? A wake, right? Just like the wake of a boat. Like, everywhere that boat goes, there'll be a little wake that follows it. When you think about things, it causes like a wake throughout your body. Where your mind goes, your life follows. Let's think about this for a moment. Scripture says... Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things and the God of peace will be with you. Think this way, you'll have peace. Scripture also says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. When I was younger, I used to think, Boy, that's wishful thinking. I'm a sinner, I can't take every thought captive. But actually... The more I learn about the brain, the more I realize the one thing I can truly control are my thoughts. And that's about the only thing I can truly control. Okay, so there's a theory in psychology called cognitive behavior theory that says our thoughts, oops, my arrows got messed up, sorry. Our thoughts lead to our feelings and our feelings trigger our actions. So think about this for a moment. If you, can you right now picture a black cat? Can you picture a tornado? Can you imagine what it feels like for the, the, the feeling of the chair hitting the back of your legs? Raise your hand if you just pictured three different things. Just in a short amount of time, your brain went to three different things. Were you thinking about any of those things before I suggested it? Do you have total control of your mind and where your mind goes? Can you change it just like that? You can, right? People in prison... You can take away people's rights, you can take away their food, you, can, you, can't change, you can't make them think something. They get to have complete and total control over the thoughts that they allow to go through their mind. It's just part of how God designed our brains. So, if our thoughts lead to our emotions, and our emotions trigger our actions, you have never felt a feeling that didn't begin with a thought. If you are happy, you're thinking a thought. If you're sad, you're thinking a thought. If you're... It's another emotion. If you're angry, you're thinking a thought. The same circumstance can happen to two people. One person will get angry, the other one won't. What's the difference? What they're thinking, right? So you can control your thoughts. So that means you can then impact your emotions and your actions. If you don't like how you're feeling, if you don't like how you're acting, what am I thinking? Because you can change that thought. Whatever's noble, whatever's praiseworthy, whatever's beautiful, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things and the God of peace will be with you. Okay? So it's just a little tool that God has given us to help control our emotions and our actions. It's our thoughts. So if you don't like something, you can change that thought. And we can do that for each other. The more you think a positive thought, the easier it is to think a positive thought. Your brain actually changes. We call this plasticity. The brain that you're going to go to sleep with tonight is not the same brain you broke up, woke up with this morning. Broke up with, hopefully not. The, <laughs> that, you, that you woke up with this morning. As you go throughout the day and have experiences, your brain physically changes. You get new and different neural pathways. 
depending on what you expose your brain to. Real quick side note, I'm running out of time, so I gotta hurry. If you start doing non-productive activities during your teenage years, because the brain is, you're still wiring your brain, so you're about 25, 26, 27, your brain's under construction. It's like a construction zone. If you introduce your brain to nicotine, if you start smoking cigarettes before the age of 25, your brain actually develops to have more nicotine receptors, little docking stations that crave nicotine. If you were to wait till your brain was done developing, you'll still have an addiction, but it won't be as strong as if you start during those younger years. So what you expose your brain to during those developmental years prior to 25 is so important. If you expose your brain to lots of alcohol, it'll be a stronger craving. Your brain will actually wire to crave alcohol. Pornography, whatever it might be. So guard your heart, guard your mind, guard your brain because so much flows from that. Uh, sometimes, as we go through life, we just can't figure out why different things are happening to us. And I just want to encourage you, have you ever seen the backside of a tapestry? It's just a big old pile of knots, right? But, it, and, but then I think sometimes in this life, we look at our life and we're like, it looks like a big old pile of knots. Why did that happen? Why was that there? Why did that person come into my life? Why did I have that experience? I think when we get to heaven, we're going to see what God sees. We're going to see the backside of that tapestry and how he was working through all of those different things. When it comes to purpose and identity, I dropped out of college my first time around. Nobody in my family had ever gone to college. I come from a blue-collar working-class family. Aunts, uncles, cousins, nobody had ever graduated from a four-year college. My parents said, you ought to try. You're pretty good at that school thing. Give it a try. I ended up dropping out to go to work for a, a record company in Nashville, okay, which had always been my dream. I went back to New Ulm to be a teacher when I was 27. I graduated from New Ulm on my 31st birthday. I am a late bloomer, okay? <laughs> I went on to get my master's, went on to get my PhD, was a dean and a professor at a college, vice president of, of Kingdom Workers. None of this was my plan. I, I, when I was sitting in the chair at your age, I was never gonna be a teacher, okay? I'm, my encouragement is just, you can plan all you want, but what I would encourage you to do is just be open. Be faithful, love God, love others, be open to God, and he will create a pathway. And I suspect that pathway will exceed anything you could ever plan as you just stay open to how he wants to use you. So that's my big encouragement. Summation, love God, celebrate Jesus, serve those around you with the gifts he's given you. I know it can be easier said than done. Stay connected to the word. As you stay connected to the word, the fruit of the spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that's the stuff the world is longing for. And you and I have it for free as we stay in the word and we can invite other people to join us so that they can experience that as well. Let's skip that. And again, this is all easier said than done, but again, our ultimate resource. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within you, to him be the glory. The God who created the universe lives inside of you and he wants to work with you. He wants to work through you to touch the world. May God bless you as you work in partnership with him. So, thanks for your time. Thanks.